Hello and welcome to the next episode of Life Without Email. We are really excited for this show. We've kind of been like all giggly in the prep and the run up to this session, especially Louis. I don't know what's up with him today. <laughs> Must be the weather, I tell you. It must be the weather, but it's cloudy by you. It's sunshine by me. Hey. Which, is why, which is why I need to put my smile on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but before we carry on with that, we've got a very special guest with us today. And I want to say a very big and warm welcome to Andy Swan. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's really nice to be with you guys. Really excited. Yeah, Andy, we're really excited to have you with us. Um, I've been working with Andy for a while over the past few months. We met each other at the Silicon Beach Conference last year. And a project that Andy was involved in, which he's naturally going to tell us a bit more about, got me really excited. And so I approached Andy at the conference and I was like, Andy, I need to know more about this project and I want to showcase it to the world. So what I'm basically going to do is I'm just going to give Andy literally a few minutes to just give us a bit of an orientation in terms of who he is and why he calls himself the work experimenter. <laughs> cool. Okay. What a task to start things off. Um, perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much. It's a great opportunity to say in front of the world. Thank you, Claire, for your support as well. Um, right back, I think it was back in September when we met at Silicon Beach. And I was literally right at the very start of, of this idea I'd had. So I struggled. Over, over a few years, I'd been thinking about work, and I'd worked in jobs I didn't like. And I could see other people you know, not being motivated in the work they did. And I had a, a kind of a few conversations over last summer, and I'd become really interested in organizations and what make people productive at work and what make people happy at work or, or engaged at work. And I just suddenly, um, one thing led to another, and I decided to embark on a project um, which was me trying to change my relationship with work or understand what the concept of work actually is um, by removing myself from all normal structures of work and trying to find an alternative way to make a living over 12 months. Um, and so, yeah, that was the work project. So I am... Uh, my website is IamTheWorkProject.com because I literally am. It's an experiment on work with me as a guinea pig, me as the work experimenter. Um, but the insight I gain, I can then give back to other people and to organizations to understand how we might be a little bit more human about the whole thing. Brilliant. So naturally, we are going to get into the nitty gritty of that a little bit later in the show. Um, while we asked Andy to come onto the show and share with us today what he's going to be sharing with us, it's all about this project that he's just told you about, I Am The Work Project. But more specifically, as part of this project, he decided to adopt a no email life. So he's literally in the middle of this whole thing. So technically, he kind of like started two projects in parallel, if you think about it, because he started the I Am The Work Project and the no email project at the same time. And so we thought it would be great to bring Andy onto the show to share with us the struggles and the joys that he's experiencing in these very, very early phases. Because I'm four years down the line, Louis is more than four years down the line, he's seven, eight years down the line. So in many ways, we kind of forgotten what happens in those first, first few phases, and we thought it would be brilliant to bring Andy in. So Louis, I'm going to hand over to you at this stage, and I'm going to ask you to just share with us what you remember from the complexities of those very, very first early months. Okay, uh, talking about remembering, uh, I didn't even introduce myself. Can you imagine that? <laughs> my God, I was just so carried away by my... Uh, anyway, hi everyone. Uh, we do have some live watchers on the show, and I encourage them as well to go into the live chat where you guys can go and, leave and ask questions there or directly under the Q&A section, right? So don't forget about that. You do have a chance to ask Andy, our guest, our guest speaker for today, about it. So, um... Seven years ago, my God, what were some of the major complex strategies that I was bumping into? Well, the number one that I can tell you is that change is hard, especially when it's not you, the one who needs to change, right? Because, you know, as you get started with those, this no email journey, the number one thing that people are going to tell you is that, hey, yeah, it's nice that you go and stop using email, but if people continue using email, you're still going to be stuck, right? So that's one of the things that it will come early in the game, and I'm sure that Andy will probably share similar experiences in terms of how if you want to break email, you want to break the chain, uh, you need to get people on board. And people on board means people who you work with and you collaborate with closely, right? And the other major complex item that I can think about in terms of, of the no email man tries you move into the initial stages is not knowing where to start, right? And I know that this may sound easy, but that was actually my biggest 
learning or a hard moment, beginning, um, which was essentially when I tried to do everything at one point and go to inbox zero as in no more email from day one, that was a nightmare, right? Um, that was one of my key early learnings in terms of do it in a small increments, do it over the course of time, do it over a period of time that will be comfortable not just for you but also for those folks around you so you help them adjust to the new reality of how you want to collaborate together. Right? And, and that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of time, energy, patience, um, tremendous mental patience I would say. We, we'll mm -hmm. see that coming through in the conversation I'm sure. Right? Yeah. So the major two things probably so far in terms of, of what needs to happen is um, first is figure out how you want to convince everyone else. And I'm not saying convince, I think you have the right way. No, I'm, convinced, I'm thinking more convincing along the lines of why don't we open up a conversation of how we collaborate and figure out if the way we're doing it is effective or not by email, and if not, what can we do? Right? And the second item is actually to um, be patient enough to realize that you want to achieve it from day one, that it's going to take months before you can actually achieve significant effort, right? Um, and when I started myself, there was like, you know, seven years ago, um, I had benefits early, early, early on, but it was also because of brutal move. I don't recommend everyone to go through that brutal move that I did, and I will explain throughout the episode why I mean what I do not recommend it, right? Yeah, Lou, you know, so many of the things that you've said, Louis, really, really resonate with the things that I experienced when I went through this. You know, you said things like change is hard, getting people on board, not knowing where to start. And it's interesting, if I think about the conversations that we've been having with Andy and people like Lee and Perry and all the people in this community that are starting on this journey this year, so many of these things are resonating. You know, if you just think about the questions that Lee was asking on Twitter earlier today. So, yeah. Andy, I'm going to hand over to you at this point, and I'd like you to really get into the details of what you're experiencing. And I think for the benefit of the people listening and for the people who want to take some really good things, practical things out of this, if you can break that down for us into where you are in the process, you know, how long have you been on this journey, and if you can be very specific about the hurdles that you're facing, and then also the joys, the, the benefits, the positives that are coming out of this. Cool, absolutely. So so with that introduction, um, yeah, this, what, what a task. Off we go. Okay. So <laughs> I probably bet if I start with a bit of background as to what kind of sent me over the edge with email in the first place, because like you said there, it coincided with with, with starting the work project. So I was changing my relationship with work um, and thinking about these things a lot more and it made me question everything I was doing. The kind of processes we go through every day which we just accept as work. Um, yeah. yeah, and email is one of them. Everyone, you know, most people get to work in the morning, they, they check their inboxes, you know, all day we're flicking back and forth from our inbox, we're waiting for things to come through, we're stressing ourselves out and you know, it, it costs us productivity and there was just a day towards the end of last year where I'd, I'd been on the, on the work project for a couple of months, but part of what I'm doing with the work project is mini projects to, to understand how I work and, and how other people work. So just I was just looking at my inbox and I realized I hadn't checked my personal email for about three or four weeks just because I couldn't bear to look at the inbox anymore. I was getting so much spam through, so many subscriptions through, and I just, I'd just given up on that email account, but it was still accruing email every day. And then I started to think about the emails that I get from a work perspective. Um, and it kind of linked in with one of, one of the, the jobs that I previously had. I used to modernize medical records departments in hospitals. And one of the big bugbears, um, when I used to talk to records management system providers, one of the big bugbears, even kind of 10 or so years ago, was the amount of data that was being held in email systems. So if you and I were emailing each other, I may email you a PDF. Um, or if I copy three other people in, so four copies of that PDF might get made. If a reply comes back, duplicate copies of that file are going backwards and forwards. And actually, even 10 years ago, I was thinking there must be a more efficient way to store data, to work around data, to talk to each other. Um, yeah, and towards the end of last year, it just got to a point where I was looking at email, I was checking multiple accounts, and I just thought there must be a better way to do this. And under my mantra of simple, better, more human, I just realized actually, I found email to not be a very human way of communicating. I just kind of decided that must be a more human way to talk to people. You know, actually, yeah. I started thinking 
most appropriate way to communicate. You know, why am I sending emails when actually I could pick up the phone, or you know, or we could have a Skype call, or you know, and, and actually sending tasks backwards and forwards and pieces of work. And there are platforms that I can manage my work on better. And it's just kind of part of me getting myself organised. Yeah. Just kind of kind of bundled on email, and, and it just kind of there was a day I just. I can't remember what happened. Things built up, and I just got over the edge, and I just wrote a blog without thinking. I'm giving up email. At the end of 2014, I am going to give up email. So I decided at that point, and I'd given myself about two weeks lead in. So I knew as of the 1st of January, it was coming. It so was coming, yeah. So yeah, this, is, this, is, this is really interesting because I, I actually broke away from email in February of 2008. So something happens at the beginning of the year where we actually go and decide, I had enough of this, you know, and, and just like Andy said, you know, throughout 2014, I said, you know, this is it. I, I'm, I'm reaching the tipping point where enough is enough, right? And, and it's funny because it does happen around that time when we feel that something needs to change, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, Andy, if you, you know, I'm, I'm, I know that you were watching the previous episodes as well where we talk about identifying what are the actual problems with email, right? And I think that's one of the things that, uh, Deep inside, we all know about that it's probably not as good as an effective as it was, but for all of the reasons that you have mentioned, and plenty more, right? But the thing is, the thing that makes it different is that you have the situation where plenty of people keep saying, you know, it's a broken system, I don't like it, I hate it, it's stressing me out, and yet they don't do anything about it. Whereas you say, this is it. 2015, January 1st, I'm off email. And it's now mid-April, almost mid-April, and you're still doing it. So um, tell us some about the joys that you're experiencing, because I think that Claire mentioned, you know, about some of the disadvantages, potential disadvantages, and we will talk about that. We actually have got a question coming through the live Q&A that talks a little bit about a potential disadvantage of not using email, right, and I will bring it up shortly. But first, Andy, tell us a little bit about what have been some of the major joys or aha moments when you thought, like, my God, if I would have known this, I would have done that like ten years ago? Completely, yeah. Um, I think I, th I think that that's a really good point. There has been joy, but there has been pain as well. And I think it's quite important to cover the pain as well as the joy. But yeah, the, the joys were immediate. So at the end of the year, I spent time just going through all the all the kind of any email that came into my inbox leading up to, to the end of 2014. I was just looking at it saying, well, do I need this? Is it something I've subscribed to? Do I need to subscribe to it? Will I see that information anywhere else? Could I use a subscription roll-up service just to get one email if I needed it? And I literally just unsubscribed from so many things that were providing a lot of noise. You know, there were things I never looked at, but instead of unsubscribing, I deleted. But then that was still, you know, they were still kind of, they fill your brain as they, as they come in. So... Immediately, as soon as I kind of got to the 1st of January, I had this kind of relief that actually I'd already filtered out a lot of the noise. Um, and it, that, that all of a sudden became, became a really nice feeling. And because I felt more positive about it, the emails that were coming in, I could kind of take a, a better approach to and then start to consider a bit better how I responded and actually where I could push those conversations. Um, so that was a really nice feeling. I think the second nice feeling, it was kind of... There was Hello. Andy, can I, before you go on to the second one, there's actually a point that I want to make there about that, which kind of doesn't affect the individual, or it does impact the individual, but this is something that I think technology companies and just general businesses out there are going to have to start really, really rethinking. So we're going to get to the hurdles, and one of the biggest hurdles is that right now, email marketing, hands down, is still one of the best mechanisms for sales in a company. So if this whole life without email is going to happen, that is definitely a big thing that needs to be addressed, okay? But there's the ugly side of that where people just automatically, so you might sign up for an app or, you know, you might sign up for a software as a service type of thing and you just automatically, as part of their terms and conditions, you get signed up for their newsletter. I don't want your newsletter. <laughs> really don't want it. And if you make me unsubscribe more than once because you keep adding it back in there, then you start getting a very angry Claire. And I think what's starting to happen because people are so overloaded, which you yourself said, and you know, it might just be in your inbox. You're actually not even reading that email, but it's clattering your brain. And people are starting to realize that. And people's tolerance levels of that level of spam is reaching the same tolerance levels that people have for actual spam coming through their door. You know how people actually have on their post boxes no junk mail? It's I think something is going to start happening like that where people are just like, I'm done with this. 
And I think email marketers are going to have to start taking that really seriously. And more importantly, businesses are as well. You know, so so there's the individual impact that we're talking about, yeah, but we also need to keep in context the, the wider impact that flows from this. So, but anyways, enough of a side route there. Andy, back to you and your joys. <laughs> That's a really important point, and I think that's something that's overlapped with with my own thinking. You know, as I've as I've had to, this has kind of coincided with me trying to put together a, a way to earn a living in a different way. And actually, you start thinking a lot more. Actually, it's about relationships. So I think the default way to to kind of to market or to sell has always been cold calling, cold emailing, email marketing, and all of those kind of things. But because of the way I've rethought my own work, actually, I found. It may be a longer development cycle, but actually just meeting people, going out, being in the world, having cups of coffee with people is a far more productive, or for me, it's proving to be a far more productive way to understand how I might work and who I might work with. Um, and it's actually yeah, a much more human way to interact, and you can decide, well, would we work well together? Um, but yeah, so I, th I think that's, uh, that's all really linked, and actually that's one of, been one of the benefits for me. It's actually made me think who I'm speaking with, how am I speaking to them, and actually who I want to work with. You know, and this person is a human. Do, will we work together? Will our organizations work together? And actually, yeah, really taking the time to get to know people, not just bombarding them with, with messages saying, this is what I do, this is what I can do for you. Um, and I've really enjoyed that. You know, I've been open in the last few months up to some really interesting people and just had some really nice kind of conversations and meetings purely because I've just opened myself up to them. Um, you know, I've had meetings walking around galleries, I've had meetings sitting in parks, and, you know, just, just cool things. If I'd have sent a cold email, I've learned things and met people and had experiences that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Um, so that's been really cool. So so the first month after I kind of kind of decided I was I was going email free. I almost, I'd almost expected to go zero email, and I'd, I'd come up with an out of office um, message that said, "I'm not using emails anymore. Here's how you can contact me, or yeah, if, if we need an alternative way, you know, let's chat." And my phone number was on there, my Skype account was on there, Twitter handle, LinkedIn, Facebook, all of the different possible things. Yeah, Instagram account, different kind yeah. of creative ones you might. You might share information, you know, Dropbox and OneDrive for actually sharing files and all of these things. But it then turned out that the way my emails are configured, I couldn't get the out of office to only go the first time someone emailed me. Emailed me. <laughs> on the second day, I got involved in it. And this, this kind of, this is one of the things that opened me up to one of the, the kind of drawbacks was in the first day, I got in a conversation with a group of people who we were going to share a um, share an event with. And there are about six or seven people, and basically my out of office was going every time. <laughs> so you know, people were getting seven or eight versions of my out of office, and it was just actually making people cross. And it made me very quickly think: actually, what am I doing here? Am I trying to reduce email for me, or am I trying to preach to people that you can't email? You know, you might like email, but you shouldn't, and actually make it difficult to contact me. So. That became so. The first month, I had a real cut down on emails. I think in the end, I didn't go email free, but I sent. I think I sent 22 emails in the whole month, which for me was a massive, massive reduction. Yeah, normally what I was doing per morning. Um, so I was really. Yeah, I kind of wrote a blog post. Andy, can I? Can we unpack that one a bit? Because I think that is quite important. So in the space of one month, because there's a few different things that I think are important for us to unpack here. The me versus enforcing your way onto other people, which kind of defeats collaboration in and of itself. <laughs> and I'm going to turn that to Louis, because Louis has got a lot to say about this topic. But what I just want to ask you is, let's get down to the bottom of the actual numbers. So how many emails would you have been sending on a daily basis? I think it depends. You know, it depends on circumstances. But yeah, there there are times I could have been sending 50, 60 a day. And 50 that's to not 60. Really, that's wow. not really doing a you know, mail out or you know, or actually doing a mail shot or something. Yeah, mail jump or something like that. That's you know. That's just general are, conversations. Yeah, definitely. I mean, particularly pre-work project when I when I used to have a management position. You know, I had yeah, kind of up to fifty people working for me. I had to report into various people. I was providing a service to a hospital. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were times when I could comfortably cross a hundred emails in a day. Yeah, yeah. So you were able to cut the like. Let's take it on the conservative end. Fifty emails a day, right down to twenty for the whole month. Twenty. Tw yeah, I think twenty-two for the month was the figure. Twenty-two for the month. Okay. So before we move on to your next story, Louis, I want you to unpack that one a bit. The whole thing of making the strong stand. I'm not going to do email anymore, and then basically forcing that rule onto other people because it's an important point. We need to we need to discuss it. Uh, yeah, but probably forcing is a bit of a stronger word. <laughs> I wouldn't use it. 
right? Okay. Um, okay. What you would do is you would entice people to think different, right? So, for instance, one thing that Andy did that I didn't do was to set up an out of office. I did not set up an out of office when I started doing the no email thing. And the reason why I didn't do it was exactly because of the problem that Andy said. It was going to be irritating more people than helping them understand different, right? So the way I, I basically deal with that enticing people to think different and question how they work is eventually gather them all together in a single space, whether it's a meeting room, whether it's a conference call, whether it's a, you know, whatever, coffee bar sounds like a great idea according to, you know, what Andy was doing, meeting up some people and everything else, and get them to open up and say, what if we start doing things different? And then people would say, oh, like, what do you mean start doing things different? So yeah, what if we would have stopped using email? That's how I did it, right? And then they said, uh, yeah, then what? I said, well, I'm not doing any email anymore, so if I need to collaborate with you guys, we need to look for other ways. Mm -hmm. So at that point, people would think that you're forcing them to be off email. But I also look from it into the other side, which is every time that someone sends me an email, they're forcing me to use email without asking me about it, right? So one of the things that I keep telling people about in terms of how you work with teams, which we don't do enough when we collaborate, is negotiate, right? Is bringing negotiation into the equation and say to people, you know, how do we look for a way that we are all comfortable working and collaborating? Um, if it happens to be email, great, but I think that we all know many of the things for which email does not work as a collaboration tool. We talked about it in previous episodes. Andy has mentioned some of the various different issues with it. And that's when you start opening up to different ways of thinking, to get people to say, yeah, what are the alternatives? What are the choices? You know, 10, 15 years ago, we probably didn't have much of a choice than just do email at work, right? 10, 15 years later, we have got tons, we have got hundreds, if not thousands of options of choices and eventually and this is this is what I think is really important about not forcing or you know enticing people is helping people understand that there are choices and that it may be a time to pick up a new choice and that new choice is perhaps working in a smarter way in a more open way in a more social way in a more collaborative way right mm -hmm. uh, I mean Andy has shared some of the various different joys and, and advantages there are plenty more we will keep talking about those for many episodes to come uh, I will probably you know later on in the episode we'll talk about some of them as well but it's also interesting that there will be challenges and the good thing about the challenges is that they are the ones who constantly make you think whether you're moving in the right direction right yeah. Um, most people probably don't know this, but on the third week when I started doing this no email thing, I was on the brink of giving up on giving up email. Why was that? Because I wasn't coming across to people. You know, people were still using email, I was still co collaborating with, sometimes without, with email, I wasn't there. So I kind of like started missing out what I thought were critical conversations that I needed to know about. Yeah. Until one day I realized, you know what? Um, it may be probably my Spanish temperament of being stubborn and everything, but I said, I'm going to stick around with this and see what happens. And you realize that plenty of the traffic that comes through, eventually you didn't need it in the first place. There, were, there was far too much noise out there that, while potentially perceived as helpful, it eventually wasn't helpful, right? Yeah. So and I think what you do is you become a little more focused on how you collaborate with people by helping them understand how things need to change. And that's about opening up those conversations, for instance. Yeah. And I think, Louis, you know, it's interesting what what we do as a company whenever we start engaging with a client, we actually, one of the very first sessions that we have with them is it's like what we call the rules of work session where we have that conversation. How are we going to work together? Yep. But it's really interesting because anybody who understands the, the tactics of negotiation would understand that one of the tactics in negotiation is challenging assumptions. And that's essentially what we're talking about here is, you know, and, and I have this conversation very regularly with people and I'm like, if you think about it, so many people, so many companies make the assumption that people know how to work. And yes, people do know how to work, but do people know how to work well? Do people know how to work within your company? You know, and so you make the assumption that somebody knows how to process email. You make the assumption that somebody knows how to work with documents. But the fact of the matter is, is that everybody has sort of like just created their 
own little method of working. You mm -hmm. throw a hundred of those, a thousand of those, five thousand of those into a company structure and tell people to go to work and you wonder why an entire workforce is at their wit's end like we see in, in today's modern workplace. You know, and, and, so, and, that, and, and you're absolutely right and I'll tell you something um, because this is a perfect segue for one of the questions that came through live session which is talking about assumptions, right? Uh, and I'm going to add a little note about it. When I was, um, I, I lived in Dublin for about a year, many years ago, and someone basically at work told me to never assume anything because it makes an ass of you and me. Yeah. So never assume anything, right? So always be willing to challenge things and everything else. But talking about assumptions, so one of our uh, live viewers, uh, you guys know him very well, uh, Doc Shaw, mentions that um, he wants to hear a bit some tips and I'm going to ask Andy this question and then perhaps we can also share a couple of, of tips in there uh, about encouraging teams to collaborate across organizational boundaries, right? Uh, lots of big, bis big business still restrict the access to tools that we freelancers take for granted, right? Uh, especially when you talk about the firewall and everything else. So the assumption is, and this is my add-on to Doc's question, my assumption is that just because we haven't thought much about it, we all take for granted that even our clients would want to work with us via email. So the question to Andy from Dark is, what can we do to break those barriers, those boundaries, and help people collaborate across companies without using email? And the additional add-on for me is, how do we break the assumption that even our clients want to work with email when I can tell you guys that they don't want to? Interesting, interesting question. Um, but that, it's a really great lead-in as well to some of the frustrations I've actually found as I've as I started. Um, in the, after the euphoric first month, I actually found that email was starting to creep its way back because I got busier, I picked up some new customers, and actually, by default, they wanted to email. So I started doing some work to, to move the conversations away, but it was a balance to actually how to kind of, you know, gradually move people away from email. But I started using... Um, Glip and Slack and obviously Uscapes out there as well for kind of for, for collaborating with the companies I work with and it, it was working really well. Um, but you, know, you, you kind of, I mean, as you said, Claire, you, know, you have the initial meeting um, and in my case it was with two people who were the initial people I was working with in a particular organisation and they got the idea, you know, quickly got the idea that actually if we work together on Glip, we can share all the files we need, we can have conversations, everything's in one place, it's all nicely ordered and we can find what we want and work really productively. But as we start to bring other people in on the conversation, I had one particular instance yesterday where I'd ask someone a question, and they said, oh, this, it would be someone else who who answers this. Um, can you let me know your email address, and I'll put you two in, I'll email you and put you both in contact. And I was trying to say, well, why don't we just bring him into Glip as well, so he can see the whole conversation, and we can all be party to it, and work in that way. But it's, it's breaking that kind of cultural cycle. And I think, you know, knowing Doug as I do, um, we work in very similar ways. You know, we're individuals who go out and work with organisations, and actually, it's quite difficult. Particularly from my point of view, as I started, you know, the work project was simultaneously going on, and actually, I was trying to rebuild a way to earn a living. And so, as I started to get the first few pieces of work that I've had in ages, and in a brand new way with new organisations, it's very difficult. You kind of think, do I want to be jeopardising this new relationship by saying? Why don't we communicate in a different way, however gently? So, so it's, it's a really difficult balancing act. And I'm not sure that I've found the answer yet because, as I say, even when I'm moving conversations onto what I see as appropriate platforms, you, know, you still have people who automatically say, well, let's, let's move this conversation to email. And you kind of say, well, no, let's keep it over here because it's, it's more in control. But it's, it's trying to strike the balance. So I've certainly I've reached a point where I think I'm, I'm definitely sending you know, um, more than 20 emails a month at the moment. I haven't counted um, over the last month yet. But it's because it's, it's a gradual process to kind of, to kind of particularly with new relationships, to move those people into more appropriate conversations. But I always try to, whenever a conversation arises, try and suggest if a face-to-face -face meeting isn't possible, we go for a Skype, you know, where we're collaborating on, on a task or a project. Actually, let's move this into Slack or Glip or somewhere elsewhere we can actually just house that whole thing. We can manage the task and we can put the calendar and we can all see what each other are doing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's such a massive cultural barrier and email still being the norm. It's very hard to, to kind of know how far to push because yeah. I think... You know, it was, I think... Sorry, I, th ahead. I think something that's very important, yeah, and, and I can say this, I wasn't able to say this 
in the beginning of 2012 when I set out on this experiment, but I've actually documented and kept very, very close track of this because it's an important number to have. The only people who have ever, ever pushed back on me and absolutely insisted that we work on email have been people in technology companies who are basically developing email embedded tools. <laughs> Hands down. And I've had this conversation with thousands of people, okay? And I mean, like Louis, I stand up on stages, I address hundreds and hundreds of people very regularly, and nobody has refused me downright except people in those areas whose actual businesses and livelihoods depend on email, which is understandable. They need to defend the tool. But I think we need to have, as with any change, okay, if you think of, of anybody out there who, is, who has gone about bringing big, big societal change, because what we're talking about here is ultimately not just company culture change, it's literally societal change. It takes a very strong person. It takes somebody who's willing to stand up and have a difficult conversation. And as you say, Andy, it's not an easy conversation to have, but I think the difference is, and I, when I'm working with companies, very often, dealing with the leadership team, when you're not dealing with the CFOs, the CEOs, the COOs, the employees lower down the chain are saying, well, I can't tell my boss that I'm not going to email, you know, that that's how we work. How can I have that conversation with him? I think the important thing is it's not a question of having the conversation and saying, I'm not going to email. It's about having a conversation about, I want to do better work. And that's, that's the important thing that we need to start getting about this. It's not about switching off email. It's about doing better work. And I think that's, that's where the mind shift happens. And if you think about it, no client and no boss or senior person to you is ever going to turn around and go, I don't want you to do better work for me. Because when you justify what you're doing because you want to deliver a better result, because you want to be a better person, Nobody in their right mind is going to turn around and say, "No, I can't do that." You know. That's, that's an excellent. That's an excellent point. I mean, it's it's like uh, I'm I'm going here like violently agreeing. Like, <laughs> it was spot on. I don't know of any client who does not want you to deliver the best of quality work that you can do. And and the mm. the tip that I was going to suggest to try to answer as well some of Doc's question is that. For me, at least in my experience, what it requires, it requires a bit of education and enablement of the client. I mean, if it is a client that you're going to do a one-time thing, a one, you know, one kind of gig where you go and interact one short time and then you move on, yeah, probably may, may be the easiest way to do it. But if it is actually going to be work that you're going to continuing over the course of time, whether it's a week or two weeks or two months or two years, early in the game, make the effort of caring for the client, get together with the client and said, for me to be able to give you the best quality work, we need to find a better way to collaborate on email. The first thing that the client will tell you is, oh, really? Can you get me off email? Show me. That's what they will do. At least that's what, they have. That's what I have been doing for the last seven years and why I work with multiple clients nowadays and I don't use email with them. Right? And again, the, 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 thing, the key message there is, do you want to commit and make the time to educate your clients? If the answer is yes, you will get them off email, which means that you will be able to produce more quality work for them. If the answer is no, you probably will be just dragging it back into email for as long as you will be able to go with, right? And, and that takes me um, into a follow-up, a question from Doc as well, where he mentions that his experience is not the same one as Claire's, um, indicating that perhaps Clear sees different things as part of what the challenge is, right? And in terms of how people work and react from that point of view. So, because uh, somehow Doug feels that it may be a bit too rosy and pink in terms of, oh yeah, I'm going to buy into the whole thing, right? So, Claire, perhaps can you share some experiences of how you have actually worked with clients, moving them off email? Off email, yeah. Doug, you make a very valid point, and I think. I think we need to emphasize, and if you think about it, like this is the thread that's coming through from what Andy's saying, and Louis has emphasized it, and I will emphasize it as well. This is not an easy journey. It's it's not an easy conversation to have. So hands down, I'm not trying to paint a rosy picture. It is challenging, but I think 
when you do make that shift from this is not about being difficult about email and about how we work, but you move the conversation in the direction of delivering better work for you, collaborating better with you, not creating more stress, not creating overwhelm, but wanting to create a happy workplace where we can really find joy in the work that we're doing together. It definitely opens clients up. So practically how I approach the conversation with clients is when naturally if it's an inbound sale where a client is wanting to work with me on something specific generally the process that's followed is you'd have your initial meeting which will be like a briefing session which then goes to proposal stage which then goes to contract stage during that proposal meeting or that initial briefing meeting just before the proposal stage in that session I actually explain to clients how I work and instead of saying to them, I expect you to work in this way with me, I actually open up the conversation. I say to them, this is how I currently engage with all of my other clients. How do you feel about that? And then I just keep dead quiet. And I actually just allow them to talk. I, I, I give them that space. And it's very interesting because a lot of people have actually never been asked that question, how do you work? It's, it's a question that genuinely surprises people and it stops them in their tracks. And they like they some of them will react and say um, I've never really thought about that let's go with your way can you show me how to do it which then goes back to what Louis said about educating and enabling clients which is then where I show them our project management spaces I show them how we work I show them how it's different to email and I also show them more importantly how notifications from those systems can become a very big blockage in their emails so they either need to create filters to filter that out to filter that noise out or they need to make a deliberate decision to not be in the inbox but to actually be working in the project space and then where there has been people that I've had to engage with who have like adamantly refused to use like any other thing I've happily said to them, that's fine. If for whatever reason you don't do not feel comfortable, I've actually said to these clients, I will work with you in email. But it's very interesting with every single one of those where there has been that very strong pushback because of the industries that they've in. They've actually come back to me somewhere in that project, time and scope, and they've said to me, Claire, you've really gotten us thinking about work and something but is broken. So Claire, let me say, say something here because Dark has added up some very excellent comments that I think were fitting nicely with the last sentence that you just said, right? So obviously Dark mentions that he gets a quality thing, but what if email is part of the better quality solution? And uh, he's also asking us whether we're saying that you will consistently push to refuse to use email, right? I think from what your answer just mentioned there, uh, although not directly to this question, is that obviously if the customer insists that you, they, they would still want to use email as part of their solution for the way of how they collaborate and, and communicate. Um, I would venture to state, and this is a question that I'm going to ask both of you, Claire, and you, Andy, will you still continue pushing for a different way of working, or will you adjust and continue using email with our client? Andy, I'm going to let you take that first, and then I'll answer from my perspective. Okay, cool. Thanks. So for me, my, I mean, my biggest learning, I've kind of come to, I've kind of come to strike a balance. So my kind of mantra around the whole no email journey now has become communicate and collaborate in the most appropriate way. So for me, I find email is very rarely the most appropriate way. So I try to move the conversations to where I think they should be. Um, that's not to say that if someone insists they want to email, I won't take an email, but I will then try and move the conversation to where I think it should be. You know, equally, as I said, I had a customer who tried to move a conversation from Clip onto email, but actually I think that the best place for it was in a collaboration project management space. So actually I'm trying to move the conversation back in. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think for me it's, it's it doesn't necessarily need to be a hard push. It doesn't need to be, we won't use email from day one, take that or don't work with me. Actually it's here's how I like to work. Look at the benefits if we manage our conversations that way. But if you want to email me a remittance advice because you pay my invoice, happy days, I'll take I'll take that email. Um, so so yeah, for for me it's it's very much a balance. And I think yeah, you know, I think setting out on a no email journey and expecting not only a zero inbox, but absolute zero email traffic completely would be would be very difficult because it still is the cultural norm for most of the business world. So actually, it is a yeah. It's gradually, like you say, Claire, gradually breaking down those perceptions and getting people think, to think about the way they work and how they're productive and and what you know, what are the, the most efficient ways they can they can get things done. Um, 
And I think if, if you kind of take that approach, and yeah, you can kind of gradually chip away and say, well, look, if you really need to email, we'll start by emailing, but why don't we consider this? Mm -hmm. uh, and then push out the conversations to the most appropriate places. Yeah. From my from my perspective, um, I like Andy said, I fully agree with him. You always choose the most appropriate thing. So in my experience, there's basically five areas that, that people work. So they work either around documents, they're working around time, which is generally a calendar, okay, or there's meetings and conversations, and then there's email. You know what I mean? So and then the one on top of that is then tasks. And I want to discuss specifically the, the area of tasks. The reason why people, and there's many reasons why people are stuck to their email and don't want to move away from email is, but it's mostly, 90% of the time, it's related to tasks. People use their inbox as a task manager. And that's why they get anxious when you say, I don't want to email, because in the back of their mind, they're going, oh no, but that's my task list, so if it's not in my inbox, I'm going to miss tasks. Okay, And then they start getting panicked. And this is one of those key conversations that I bring in with clients about delivering better work is that I don't want to be distracted when I'm working on your project, so I don't use my email as a task manager. My tasks live in a separate task area which are better handled by project management systems. And so when I'm working on your project, I am 100% dedicated, inflow focused on your work. I'm not being distracted by every other email from every other client that's coming in. Okay? You've got my focus. And Louis, I can see you smiling. Talk. I know, I know. I tell you, no, no, it's just, it's just, get, get this, get this. We have got another question which has been there for around 20 minutes. And, okay. and I'm looking for a way to sneak it in, and it's just perfect. Here's okay. a question. So it comes from, from the live question, actually. Uh, this comes from someone whose name is Simon White, and I hope that I'm pronouncing the first name correctly. Yeah, you and, are. It's Simon. Hey, Simon. So good okay. to have you listening in. So the, question, the question that he says is, you know, I've noticed how people use email for more than just communications, to cover themselves, to delegate work, etc., etc. I would say etc., etc. is probably tasks. And this is what clogs up the average inbox. So the question that he's got, and this will probably go both to you, Andy, as well as, as Claire, is do we really need a new way to work in the modern age? Andy, over to you. <laughs> need and want are probably two different things. Yeah, I completely, I completely get what Simon's saying. And um, yeah, I tend to agree. But and I think you know, people do use it to cover their backsides and or show that they've had an input. You know, if there's a conversation bouncing around on email, people want to show that they're doing something at work or they're involved or they're important. And it's actually part, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, actually all of those things are in there. We, you know, we need to be recognized for our input. So, so yeah, people jump in on conversations. They use email to just prove, you know, if their manager's in the email chain, they can show they've had an input. So and I can see it's done like that, but I kind of flip that and say, well, actually, if we were working in collaboration spaces, actually prove that point by ticking off a task, you know, showing that you've had an input in that task, moving the moving the kind of the bar of, of how much the, the task is completed up a bit. Um, but yeah, so so do we need I mean, you know, needs a big thing. You know, for, for me, do I need a different way to work for the modern world? Absolutely, because email was killing my brain. Um, <laughs> but can we work with them? Yes, albeit in a very you know, a very kind of maybe less productive way, um, but, but then yeah, yeah, it is a personal thing. People are getting by working with email, but how much productivity are they losing, how much stress are they putting themselves under, yeah, all the points that Claire's made, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know, I think, I think need is probably a personal question. <laughs> so, Claire? Yeah, I think from my perspective, it's very definitely, sorry, somebody just walked into the office there. So, from my perspective, it's very definitely we do need a new way of working. I, I agree with Andy, need and want are two different concepts, but yes, we do need a new way of working, and people don't realize that yet. So if you think about, like, think about raising a child, okay? A child doesn't know what it needs, but its parent knows what it needs. It knows it needs sleep. It knows it needs food. And when the kid is screaming at 9 o'clock at night because it didn't sleep that afternoon when it needed to sleep, and the parent is having to deal with those issues, the kid just wants to stay up. It doesn't realize that it's beyond tired, but the parent understands that. Now, naturally, working in a work environment is not like raising a kid because you don't have that authoritarian you know, structure. You have to work as equals in a work environment. Louis saying, yeah. <laughs> 
Sometimes it's like kindergarten, I tell you. Yeah, exactly. It is like kindergarten. But generally in an ideal workspace, you're looking at, at, an, at an equal balance here where you're working with equals, you're working with peers. But we need a new way of working, but we haven't realized that yet because we've just gotten into absolute work mode. We just do, 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 and we're allowing the systems to basically be our behavior, to determine our behavior, and we're not challenging that, and we're not saying, is there a better way to work? And that's why this is such a difficult challenge to tackle is because actually for the first time there's a whole group of people who are saying, hang on a minute, stop, question, and let's find a better way of working because people genuinely can't handle this anymore. Well, if you look into it, and this is something that Andy very nicely said, which is, is certainly one of the major aha moments that I have been having all along over the course of the years, uh, how I, I certainly believe that we need to find a new way of working because the way we have been currently working for the last 50 years is completely broken. And if we look into the current levels of global employee engagement, it, we should be ashamed of the whole thing. Right? So to me, it's not whether we need or want. It's, it's we don't have a choice anymore. If we want to survive as, as, as employees, as workers, as doing whatever work, you want to flag it, things need to change. And frankly, I don't think email is going to be the one that is going to change us the way we want to work, or the way we could work, right? But back to what Andy is mentioning in terms of the reflection, it's all a personal choice. Mm. And this is what I, mean, what I meant at the very beginning of the, of the conversation that we had, that we cannot change people. I cannot go in and change people and tell them, hey, you need to stop using email now, right? It's a personal choice. It's the one where the only thing that I can do is provide the necessary conditions to help people understand whether there are better ways of doing work that are actually happening. Mm -hmm. But even after doing that, it still is a personal choice of that individual to go and say, yes, I want to work different. Can anyone help me or can I help myself? And there will be some people who would say, no, I don't want to go and change because I'm way settled in my ways and it works for me just fine and go and back to someone else. Right? But Andy brings in a very good point, which is, always that one of not just being a choice, but being an individual choice. So the whole thing around change management within organizations, within business units, with clients and everything else is progress because we won't be able to change organizations. We can only influence people to think different only if they feel that they need to work different. Right? Now, the thing is, and this goes back again to, to Doug's reflection that I wanted to comment on as well in terms of how do we collaborate with, with clients. Typically, the way I do it, is for me to realize that some clients are not ready to do that kind of transformation work. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of my biggest learning lessons is to let go those who I feel are not ready to be influenced enough to change themselves. It's hard. It's money that goes away and probably doesn't come back for whatever the actual months or whatever else, right? But it's also true that it's also energy that does no longer drain yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. It's also effort, it's also time that you don't have to go and explain to people and justify your own existence, where you're truly believing, the way things could potentially work out based on what you have done over a course of, of months or years or whatever else. And yes, I know that there will be plenty of people out there who would say, you know, uh, you don't do email, fine, I do email, fine, we will never talk. It's a big world out there. Mm. Right? You move on, I move on. At one point in time, if things change, they will be changed. I mean, I remember when I started doing the no email thing back at, uh, when I was working on IBM, I was the only person doing it. I had lots of teams who basically told me, um, I'm not going to use the colorful language, but you guys can imagine, <laughs> um, to basically do something more productive than stop bugging them because they were quite happy with email. Yeah. Four years later, four years later, they came back and said, we need you to help us work smarter without email. Yeah. That's the personal transformation that needs to happen. And that's the one where I tell people about being patient. If people are not ready for themselves to make that choice, that personal choice, let them go. They will come back eventually. Right? Yeah. The, the challenge there is when they come back, are you ready to help? That's the key challenge. Right? And that's when, when the way I say it and the way I work with, with organizations and, and clients and, and basically people is how willing are you to change the way you work? 
And depending on the initial conversations that we have, I will tell you whether I can help you or whether I would let you go. And I know that for some people it may be surprising or there when they go and, and, and listen to this, but hey, at some point in time, um, if we're going to make a stand in terms of how we want to work to change, we need to make a stand. And my stand is that if you're not ready, I'm not going to help. Right? You need to have somewhere glimpses that tell me that I can sneak in and help you see the things different. And if you don't, I'm fine. I'll come back later. I'll keep coming back later. You know, at one point in time, I know it's going to click. Yeah. At least that's that's been my experience in, in the last seven years, right? So true. So what we need to do right now is because we're coming up to the end of the call, so we need to start right. wrapping it up. It's been a very very active Ooh. discussion. So just to sort of recap what we've dealt with, our guest on the show today is Andy Swan, and he's heading up a project called I Am The Work Project. And as part of this project where he's trying to redefine how we work and what work is to him, he decided to adopt a no email lifestyle. And we invited him onto the show because we specifically wanted him to share his learnings in these very, very early months of this journey. And so, Andy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to you and I'm going to ask you if you can just basically share your top two tips for anybody who wants to start embarking on this journey. You're four months in, okay? Right now, what are your top two tips? And then, Louis, I'm going to hand over to you to share your top tips from that mm -hmm. very early stage and then I'll wrap it up from there. Cool, thank you. Right, so my, my major top tip, the thing that I've loved so much, is actually how I've changed the relationship with my phone. <laughs> It has phone calls and emails, a separate, you know, completely separate things. Actually, this phone is it's a it's a communications hub because and because of native apps. So if you get apps for all the things you're going to use on your phone, you know, my phone has obviously it gets calls, it's got text messages, it's got Skype app, it's got notifiers for the various different collaboration tools I use. Obviously, there's an inbox there as well if you want it. But actually, because of the you know the different social media you use, because of the way the messages come in you know that if something comes in via Facebook, it's not going to be something that demands urgent attention. It's going to be more leisure time reading. Um, yeah, you, you know that if something comes in via instant message on Skype, it might be something, someone's asking you a quick question, or if a call comes in, obviously it demands an answer right there and then. So actually, if we start thinking of yeah, the little devices we carry around all the time as communication hubs, as opposed to something that holds separate apps, for me, that's been quite a quite a kind of liberating process. And I do, I use my phone probably more than I use even my you know, my desktop, um, my laptop now, just, just to constantly notify me of, of things. Um, so that for me has been a major thing. That's really helped me get more, more efficient. And as I say, I'm using the mantra of the most appropriate way to communicate. The phone gives me that because it helps me look at what's coming in, the channels I'm using to, to communicate um, back out. So that's number one. And number two, which I've already mentioned, is just unsubscribe. Unsubscribe from absolutely anything. <laughs> And you'll soon see how much noise has been coming into your inbox. Even if you just do that, the noise will just start to disappear. And the, the weight you'll feel lift once the noise disappears is probably the biggest first step in the direction to, to reducing email and seeing why it's a good thing to do. Yeah. Louis, over to you, your top two tips. Well, I have, I have got more than two tips, right? So this is a glimpse of many more to come, right? So number one, number one is learn to let go. Understand that no matter how critical, important you think you are to work, if you don't check your inbox, nothing will happen. Life will move on, work will move on, you need to move on, right? So what, the way I describe that tip is learn to not so much live on push, but learn to live on pull. So build different strategies of where you can find the content, the information, the connections that will help you get work done. And go where they are. So if you have got people who are using different collaboration tools, if those are the people that are going to feed you intellectually as well as work-wise, go where they are. That is their comfort zone, not your comfort zone. Get adjusted to that, right? So learn to pull versus push. That's tip number one. And tip number two is start studying how you work with your inbox. I mean, we have seen a number of different use cases already in the conversations today. Both Doug and Simon on the comments mentioned how people use it for task management, for content repository, for asking questions, for sharing project status reports, for checking out with clients. So do an introspection piece of work in terms of how you use your email. What kinds of interactions are the ones that you do the most? 
And that will help you identify the worst offenders. So people who you constantly email back and forth. Identify those, then lay back and ask yourself, why do we do this? Is there a better way? And if there is a better way, discuss it and find it, right? Now, the thing that we don't do about the inbox is we don't challenge the inbox in terms of how things work in there. It's like a Pandora's box. Everything goes, right? So start figuring out whether everything needs to go. And why I'm saying that? For something very important, and I'm going to finish off with this, and that is that there are still very good use cases for using email. There's still very good use cases, right? The challenge for people is to find which ones are those for them and then move everything else out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so to wrap up today's call, first of all, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you on board. I'm sure we'll be inviting you into future calls to basically track your journey further. I'd love to have a check and call with you after year one and definitely yeah. after year five. And <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's been great. Brilliant. Thank you for Good. And I also want to say a very big thank you to our audience who's been listening in. Your guys' questions make this this show. It definitely is because of your questions and us being able to respond and actually becoming a big community discussion that actually makes it richer. So please join us for our next one. And then I just a few takeaways to sort of close the call out. Number one, you need to have a conversation. It's important to open the space up and to have conversations about delivering better work to clients, about working better with clients, and just building better relationships. And then the second thing that I'd like to, that was sort of a point that, that Louis made was negotiate. Bring negotiation back into the table, onto the table. And what works for you, what works for me, and how are we going to find a middle ground there, which is part of the conversation that we should be having. And then the second part of the conversation that we need to be having is the education and the enablement of ourselves and of our clients and finding better ways to work. So thank you for joining us on today's thing. Um, please join us for the next no email session, which will be in exactly two weeks time, exactly the same time, Thursday, four o'clock um, UK time. And I'm going to hand over to Louis to close out to just tell us what the next show is going to be about and who our upcoming guests are. All right. So two things in there. It's probably not going to be at the exact time at the same date because I will be flying on that day. Oh, uh, Louis! <laughs> and there's Louis. no Wi-Fi. There's no Wi-Fi on the plane yet. So <laughs> we'll probably we'll probably be doing it the day afterwards on okay. on Friday 24th, if I recall correctly. Uh, and the other thing is that we had two guest speakers that were originally signed up for. Unfortunately, for the next two weeks, one of them is going to be on holidays, and the other one is going to be on a full day workshop. Okay. So um, we will probably just have both clear myself unpacking a little bit more in terms of what can be done with regards to email. But hey, here's here's an open call to folks who may have been watching today's episode or who may be watching the replay. If you have been embarking on a no email journey, whether it's been years, whether it's been two weeks, and if you want to be in the show in two weeks' time, get in touch with us. Uh, via Twitter, via Google+, Plus, if you have got phone numbers, our phone numbers, everything but email, right? <laughs> and we will be delighted to bring you into the show and share your story with us and what you guys have learned and advantages, joys, and lessons learned, whatever else happens. So we hope to see you again in two weeks' time. Thanks for tuning in. And Claire, that was it all for me. Um, Brilliant, thank yes. You, that Andy, was... as well, for joining us. Thank and you very I'll much for having me. I'll see you guys in two weeks. Cheers. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.